Well, the series is Dave. The sermon is Goliath. Welcome. The David and Goliath story is one of the most iconic and celebrated stories from the Bible. Virtually everyone who is even vaguely familiar with the scriptures would have some knowledge of the story of a young boy named David who conquered a giant named Goliath. The David and Goliath story is a story basically of triumph of good over evil. And it's a great analogy for an any unimaginable victory. It's a perfect example of the ultimate success, though it's a mixed metaphor, of the long shot over the best shot. The David and Goliath story is, in fact, the quintessential narrative of the underdog who defeats the best dog. I like this quote from Malcolm Gladwell. He writes, if the strongest win all the battles, there's no hope for the rest of us, is there? If the same people who have all the power and all the money and all the authority are going to win every contest, then what's the point of going on for the rest of us? So the underdog story gives us all who are not on top hope. The David and Goliath story reminds us that if you are in any place where the odds are against you, if God is on your side, you are definitely still in the right place. Amen. Now, the protagonists of the story we've already named, and, and just to reacquaint you with who they are, we'll, we'll talk first of all about Goliath. Who was Goliath? Well, if you go back several hundred years when the children of Israel were leaving Egyptian bondage and slavery and coming to return to their promised land, when they arrived, they would face fierce battles and it would be difficult for them to reclaim their territory. They even sent spies in to find out what was happening in the land they were about to return to. And they discovered that there were giants there. These giants most likely were the remnants of the Rephaim, a, a race of giants that had, had existed for many years. The sons of Anak, or the Anakim division of the Rephaim, the sons of Anak had settled along the Mediterranean coast in towns and villages and cities that would eventually become Philistine strongholds. And through multiple generations, as Israel returned to reclaim their land, they would have battle after battle against these Philistines. And war would be their constant challenge. On this day, the Philistines were about to re-engage in battle with the children of Israel, the Israeli army. And they met one side against another on opposite sides of the valley of Elah. And on the west side of the valley, where there was a brick at the bottom, was the Philistine forces. On the east side was the Israeli forces. The Philistines had instigated this battle because they had a plan. Nobody seemed to know what it was, at least on the Israeli side, but it became evident eventually and quite quickly. For one of the remaining sons of Anak, one of the remaining giants who stood well, if you, if you think about the average height of men in those days and, and we read what the giant was and the, in the, the measurements are given us very carefully in Scripture, he was truly a giant. He was almost twice as tall as most men. And this was the one who would lead them into battle. Well, who was the other protagonist? Well, we all know it's David or Dave. He is the youngest of eight sons of Jesse. He, uh, his father is a sheep herder and a farmer, and they live in Bethlehem. David, being the youngest of the group, is responsible for the shepherding. That is not the most happy job in the world. It meant long days away and nights away from home. It meant solitude. It meant being out on the same hills, by the way, where the shepherds were who announced the coming of the baby boy Jesus. David was a shepherd, but he was a spunky and gutsy guy that determined that he was going to protect those sheep, and he did it well. 
But in his solitary, quiet hours, he, he developed, of all, of all things, his musical skills, and he became an accomplished harpist. This was David. But the bottom line was, David's name was not any, on anyone's list of warriors, any kind of warrior to fight enemies in combat or in battle. He, he was never even thought of to be a part of the Israeli army at that time. But in the most unlikely of circumstances, there, this very boy David would be called and chosen to engage in battle against the Philistines in this battle, in this war. So you've met the protagonist. Now, you all know most of the story. So uh, I just sounded southern there for a minute. Y'all. How many of you know the plural of you all or y'all? All y'all. All y'all, that's the plural. Okay, all y'all. All y'all probably know the story somewhat. And we're going to look at it in detail in a moment, but just a quick synopsis. Uh, it was not a battle where there was army against army, but it was a battle of a personal contest. One chosen representative of each army, army would go out and fight against the other, and it would be a one-on-one, -on -one, winner take all, fight to the death. That's what this war was all about. That was the plan the Philistines had, had, and it was a master plan on their part because they had the best. They had the top dog. They had the one who was the best that, choice that anyone could have. He was this giant Philistine, and his name was Goliath, and he, he was the ultimate warrior. He, he was the impeccable, uh, one with impeccable credentials. He was a proven champion. He, he was already a champion. He'd, he'd taken the lives of many in physical combat. He had a reputation for annihilating his opponents. On the other side, Israel would send out David. Underaged, unknown, undrafted, untrained, sheep herder musician. That's not a slam against musicians, but you get where I'm going. The obvious tragic outcome when you see these two men together that had horrific implications meant that the result was going to be death loss and enslavement for Israel. It was as obvious as the, the huge nose on Goliath's face. But then came the absolutely unexpected, stunning outcome that we know about. What joyful implications now. It's so obvious that that, well, they were as obvious as the sunken stone in Goliath's forehead. Slavery was defeated. Suffering and death were punted forward to another time. What a victory. After killing Goliath, David goes on to become a national hero. However, he's viewed as a threat to King Saul, and he, who tries eventually to kill David. After Saul himself was killed in battle, David would eventually become the king of Israel. So now... Follow me, as I want to take a very close look at what was really happening, the fight between David and Goliath. You see, because a whole lot more was going on. Oh, a whole lot more than anyone knew. Anyone could never know, not just anyone could ever know, but, but, but one, David knew. David knew what was going on. Oh, yes, Dave knew. Dave knew. Dave knew when he started down that slope to the valley below where the giant awaited him, he knew. David knew when he started to bend down and pick up five stones, he knew because burned in his memory. It could never be forgotten the day that the, the, the someone came, the messengers came, the servants came and said, we need you back home. Someone very important and special there, David. And David, a young boy, runs like crazy to get back home to, to see what his dad wanted, what was going on at home. And when he arrives home, what a shock and awe moment as he meets for the first time the judge and the prophet of all of Israel by the name of Samuel. And in a private moment, 
of which very few would aware, were aware, in a private moment, Samuel would designate David to become the next king of Israel. Think about that for a moment. Dave had not forgotten. He knew, he knew that God looked beyond David's appearance and God found himself in David's heart. And David now had God in his heart and the determined hope and guarantee that he would be the next king of Israel. So on this day, on this day, as David bends down to pick stones, no doubt he can still feel the warmth and the fragrance of the sacred anointing oil that came upon him that day when he was designated. And the rush of the strength and the life that the Bible says would happen when the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, came into him on that day. He hadn't forgotten. David knew. David knew. He knew his destiny. He knew his destiny was not to be the first course for buzzards and beasts picking the bones of mangled soldiers on a battlefield that day. David knew. Dave knew when he took those stones, put them in his pouch, and with his sling, and it wasn't the kind of sling that we think about. It was a, a special kind of sling that you could sling it around with a stone in it with creating great speed and let one side go, and it would sail off. David knew when he took the stones and put them in the pouch and took his sling and started walking. No, not just walking. The Bible says he began to sprint. He began to sprint towards the giant Goliath. David knew. He knew. He knew that hundreds of years before, Jehovah God had entered into a covenant agreement. In the Hebrew, it's called bereath. Say bereath. Yeah, you just spoke Hebrew. The word, is, the word for covenant is bereath. It is a specific kind of covenant that God made with Abraham. He cut a bereath. It involved the shedding of blood. And that covenant was very important. And it was not only for Abraham, the father of all the Jewish people, but it would be for every one of them would be called his children. Exodus chapter 34 describes what happened on that day. The Bible says, Then the Lord said, I am making a bereath. I am making a covenant with you, Abraham. Before all the people, I will do wonders never before done in any nation, in all the world. The people who live among you, or the people you live among, will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. The unique thing about this bereath. The unique thing about this covenant, somewhat like, a, I suppose, a, a, a military ally, alliance of today, but went beyond that. It meant simply this. When you were in a bereaved relationship with a person or with a nation, it meant that any act of war against a nation who was in covenant or in bereaved was an act of war of any other nation or the other nation what was that was in a bereaved relationship with you. In other words, if you're going to attack me because I'm in a bereaved covenant with them, you're attacking them. You're never just dealing with one. That bereaved to the descendants of Abraham was reaffirmed and ratified at Mount Sinai when Israel came out of, of bondage and, and slavery and they came to Mount Sinai. Moses came down from the mountain with the tablets and a reminder of God's covenant. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his bereath, keeping his covenant to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Moses obeyed God in reaffirming and restating, and in that moment, it was that moment when they could experience that they were being drawn in once again to that brief covenant with God. David knew. Dave knew. What did he know? He knew that when Philistines declared war against Israel because of the brief covenant, they were declaring war on God. Dave knew. God's faithful. Faithful to his promises. Faithful to his covenant. And it meant that no giant, in fact, no army of giants could stand against Israel that day. It meant, and Dave knew, 
that the man whose destiny, who's declared, who's been declared by God, and the people who are in bereath with God will always experience God's touch, God's blessing, God's favor, and nothing can stand against them. Dave knew. <laughs> As he sprints across the field toward Goliath, Dave knew that Goliath was the one that was walking into trouble. He knew that the battle was not against David or against the army on the hills behind him. The battle was the Lord's. We sang it earlier. The battle was the Lord's. Goliath thought he was fighting David, but he was fighting Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord God Almighty, the commanders of the armies of heaven. Dave knew the Goliath and the Philistine army were in a huge heap of trouble. <laughs> the scripture in 1 Samuel reads, beginning in chapter 17, verses 45 to 47, tells us basically the end of the battle. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied this day. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I'll strike you down and I'll cut off your head. This very day I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Yes. And all those who are gathered here will know that it's not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. He knew. He knew. And so he moved with poise and fury. He took out his sling, put the stone in it, and he began to sling that round and around and around and around. And at some point he let it go and that stone began to fly. Now think for a moment. Pause. Go into slow motion. The stone is in flight. It's now no longer under the control of Dave who had set it, released it, and set it loose. But now the stone is under the control of the one who rides the clouds. It's under the control of the one whose mighty breath caused the waters of the Red Sea to rise up like walls to save his covenant people. Now that stone is traveling with the spirit speed of a missile and the accuracy of a laser and it hit and crushed the only exposed spot on the forehead of a giant named Goliath. Wow. First Samuel 17 the story continues verses 50 and 51 so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword, drew it from its sheath. And after he had killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistine's army, that's the army behind, saw what was happened to their hero, saw their hero dead, they realized it wasn't just that he was knocked out, he was gone. His head was separated from his body. They turned and they ran. The 54th verse is a little bit cryptic. Read it. David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem. Jerusalem as a city as it would become known was not known then. It was still Jabus. It was not a part of Israel's empire. Dave took the Philistines' head to Jerusalem and he put the Philistines' weapons in his own tent. All right. I'm almost done, but hang on. And now, as the famous radio broadcaster Paul Harvey would say, and now the rest of the story. Amen. 
The rest of the story begins about a thousand years after the battle. And it happens in Jerusalem. One who was called the son of David hmm, would gather his disciples in an upper room the night before he was betrayed. And Jesus, the son of David, would declare that he was about to establish a new brief, a new covenant. Jesus said to his disciples, this cup is the cup of a new covenant. You might have thought the last covenant was awesome, but it was cut in the blood of animals, slain through which Abraham passed. But this breath will be cut in my blood it's a new covenant that will go forward from here, embrace all that has been, and will embrace all that is yet to be, including the people who sit in this room and those who are watching in this moment. Jesus knew. As he sat there with the cup in his hand, he knew, he knew he'd be crucified. But he also knew the prophecy that God spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden about what would happen to the serpent who had come to destroy God's plan. Jesus knew that the spike would impale his hands and feet that would hold him to the cross. But Jesus also knew that beneath his feet would be the crushed head of Lucifer. He knew, Jesus knew, that every plan and scheme of Satan to destroy God's creation would be defeated in a new covenant. And that that plan and those schemes would be defeated on a hill outside. Jerusalem. The Bible says that's where Jesus would be crucified. Go back to the valley of Elah for a moment where the battle between David and Goliath has just ended nearly a thousand years before. The God who orders all things prompted David what do I do with this ugly head? And he hears something in his spirit. I'll tell you where to take it. I'll tell you what hill to bury it under. The Bible says David took, Golgoth, took Goliath's skull. It was probably buried in a hill just outside Jerusalem. Interesting. The name of that hill is the place of the skull. You see, David's victory over Goliath was a preview of the greatest of all victories. The most unlikely. The one that you couldn't think it could happen. One man against all of Rome and all of those who were accusing him that day. The victory of the Lord Jesus was the greatest of all victories, not over what, only what was seen, but what was unseen. For the victory that Jesus accomplished as the son of David has accomplished the victory that guarantees us all our victory. I've talked about what David knew. I've talked about what Jesus knew, what God knew. Let me tell you what you need to know this morning. You need to know and I need to know that Jesus' victory guarantees our victory. It guarantees that every follower, every follower 
who's a part of the bereath, the covenant of blood that Jesus established on the cross. Every one of us has victory. We need to know, I need to know, and you need to know that anyone and anything that comes against us is coming against the one who lives in us. Whatever's coming against you is coming against the Jesus that's in you. Whatever that's coming against you is coming against the God that's in you. Why? Because of the covenant of blood, because of bereath that God established in Christ with his blood on the cross. You must know that he will be your defender. He will be your deliverer. Did you hear me? He'll be your defender. He'll be your deliverer. Know it. Know it. And I want to tell you again today, there's no name like the name of Jesus. That's the one name. That's the one name that rises above it all. Whatever giant you're facing, whatever giant you're facing, Whatever he looks like, whatever he smells like, whatever he sounds like, I want you to know whatever your giant you're facing, he has already been defeated. Be like David and know God's got it. Amen. God's got it. Amen.